You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy. And 
This morning we can call on the name of Jesus. There is no other name by which we can. We, can, we don't only just say it, we believe it. We stand in it. The name of Jesus is our grace. The name of Jesus brought our forgiveness. The name of Jesus is our stronghold. The name of Jesus is powerful. Hallelujah. Just begin to speak that name of Jesus this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Jesus. Lord, we call on the name of Jesus. Jesus. The power of oh, Lord, 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 Jesus. 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 Oh, Lord, we love you this morning. And we trust you, Lord. Lord, I know no better place to put myself than into your hands. I know no one I can trust more than you. I don't know anyone who loves me more than you do. I don't know anyone who cares about me more than you do. I don't know anyone who can do for me 
what you can do. You are a saving God and a healing God. You're a God of power and you're a God of might. You're a God who loves to set captives free. Yes, hallelujah. 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 You're a God who breaks open the prison and doors. Things that have kept us captive, they're nothing to you, Lord. Mm. All you have to do is speak and they're gone in the name of Jesus. Church, I want to do something this morning I don't normally do. If you have a need this morning, I'm going to ask you to come around the altar. I'm going to ask Pastor Bruce to just keep playing. But I believe God wants to pour out his spirit this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe we have a name that's greater than any other Amen. name. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And I believe if we proclaim the name of Jesus over our needs this morning, they will be met through his glorious riches. If we come and surrender to him. Don't be afraid. Don't be too timid. God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And of sound mind. Yes. Jesus. If there's a burden that's been laying heavy on your heart, you need to come this morning. If there's been worry or fear, you need to come to the altar this morning. If you're struggling with a physical need, you need to come to the altar this morning. If your mind has been uneasy and unrest, you need to come today. If you have a sin that doesn't seem like it can be broken, you need to come today. If you have a stronghold that's keeping you captive, come to the altar this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I just want to speak the, the name, name of Jesus. Jesus. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within his presence. I speak Jesus. <laughs> I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Hallelujah. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Jesus in the darkness. 
victorious over every enemy. Hallelujah. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. over every enemy Hallelujah. Jesus for my family I speak the holy name of Jesus your name your name is power your name is healing your name is life thank you Jesus break every strong out of victory this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise your name, O oh Lord. Oh, I felt God do some powerful things here this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. I mean, you know, God is in the house. Amen. And you know what happens when God is in the house? Anything. Oh, he's an amazing God, isn't he? Thank you, Lord. Well, thank you. I felt like we needed to do that today. I speak the name of Jesus over my family every day. I speak it over the church every day. There is no greater name. There is no greater victor. There is no greater one who could save us, amen, than the name of Jesus. If you're not using that name, use it. If you use it in vain, stop it. If you're using it for the glory of God, keep using it. For there is victory in that name. There is power in that name. There is salvation in that name. There is healing in that name. God is good, isn't he? All the time, God is good. Praise your name, Lord. Whew. Well, let's take a moment and let the Holy Spirit continue to move and stir us. I believe that taking up an offering is an act of God. I believe it's an act of worship. I believe it's a time of celebration to the church. Malachi says that there is a portion of what we own that belongs to God. And God says that we should bring it back to him and back into his storehouse, back into the church so that his kingdom can grow and his kingdom can be furthered and his kingdom can meet the needs of our missionaries and our neighbors, our communities. And he says if you do that, there is a promise, he says, that he would pour into us riches we don't give to get, we give to bless. Yeah. And we give to God because it's his. And then we have a chance to give an offering. We get to go above and beyond. God says, return to me that which is mine, but the rest that's left over, why don't you check in on me? I may have some things for you to do that with that as well. 
and that God encourages us to give above and beyond. That's why we love our missionaries and support our missionaries. The tithe belongs to the church, but the offering goes to those things that we designated to go to. He said, we can't choose what to do with the tithe because it belongs to God. But we can choose what to do with the other 90%, amen? And God says, when we are faithful, that he is faithful. And when we give, he gives. And so let's pray over the offering this morning, shall we? Father, thank you for being a mighty, amazing, awesome, wonderful, giving God. Thank you, Lord, that there is no one else like you. You have no rival. Thank you that your enemies shudder and shake before you. And thank you, Lord, for this church who has come to honor you, who has come to find your presence and your power, has come, Lord, today to celebrate who you are in their lives. And thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to give. You give freely and lovingly, and you ask us to do the same. So, Lord, today we give in the same manner in which we received, in a spirit of joy and in a spirit of thanksgiving. And now we return it to you in the same manner that you would be glorified, that you would be exalted, that you would be lifted up, and that the church would have all that it needs, our missionaries, all that it needs to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And so thank you, Lord, as we partner together in this ministry. May you be glorified now through it all. We ask it in the name of, of all names, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Ushers. God is good, isn't he? A couple of quick uh, announcements this morning. I want to remind you, next Saturday, men, is our men's breakfast. And I will be sending out, probably on Thursday, I'll send out a little text, text them all reminder for you. What I would appreciate that what you would do, men, is, is respond back and let me know. Uh, our ladies came last month, and they cooked a meal for about 20 hungry men, and three hungry men showed up. And uh, so they ate as much as they could, but they couldn't eat at all. And uh, so I want to encourage you to, to let me know that you plan on being here so that we can let the ladies know how much food to prepare. Uh, but I want the room to be full, men. Uh, God is encouraging me. To, the, the women had it full. They had to bring out extra tables and chairs. Let's not let the women show us up, men. And uh, so it's not a competition, but, man, we just want you to come. And uh, just to be blessed and just gather together around the table and listen to what God has for us for men, as men of God. How he's going to challenge us and use us and bless us in our families and our homes. And uh, how he's going to use us to do great things for his kingdom. And I encourage you to come and be part of that. And just sit around and fellowship and have some good food and have a good time and have uh, just, a good, just fun. And uh, so that's next Saturday, men, from 8 o'clock until 9.30, uh, right here in the, the fellowship hall. I want to remind you about Celebrate Recovery. I see somebody, I think it was Dan, who put some chains out front and uh, said, you know, yeah, Celebrate Recovery is all about God breaking chains, right? He doesn't want us to live in chains. We talked about Lazarus last week and the fact that, what did Jesus say? Take off the grave clothes and set them free. Too many of us as Christians are still walking around some of our grave clothes, some of our hurts and of some of our struggles in the past, and God says, it's time for you to be set free. It's time for you to get unwrapped and realize what this freedom is all about that I've been telling you about. So come, you've been hurt. Whatever your struggle is, it's not about addictions. It's not about, it's about strongholds. It's about hurts. It's about hang-ups, right? It's about habits that you've allowed yourself to, to take hold of. God can break them all, amen? amen? And so we're trusting him with that, and that's what part of that ministry is for. It's a ministry. It's not a gathering. It's not a group. It's not a fellowship. It's a ministry because we preach the name of Jesus. We look at the word of Jesus, and we realize that there is hope in Jesus' name. So celebrate recovery. To encourage you to come. If you've never come before, just come check us out. Check us out even if, it's just, even if you're just curious. I dare you. I dare you to come to celebrate recovery just to check it out and see what it's all about. I can say that with utmost authority because I know when the Holy Spirit has you here, he will speak to you. Amen? I can give you testimony after testimony. People say, well, I came because they needed to come. 
I came for them. And it didn't take long, and they realized, no, I, nah, I'm coming for me. We all need it, amen? We, we all need that this morning. Well, we're going to dismiss the kids to Children's Church. God bless them as they go. As the children go, there's back behind us. You don't always get to see them, but there are three, there are three people behind us. Bob and Terry and Pam, sometimes Michelle, and these wonderful men and women of God serve us so faithfully. And I cannot tell you the number of times they've come to me and say, Pastor, we could use some help. We could use some help. Pam has one backup, and that's Michelle. And Michelle has one backup, and that's Pam. Terry doesn't have a backup. Chad sometimes. Bob doesn't have a backup at all. If Bob doesn't do it, it doesn't get done. Oh, yeah, we, we do the old phone thing. All three have come to me recently and said we could use some help. It's not rocket science. It just takes a little effort. It takes a little commitment. It takes you some time to be trained and taught. But you can all do it. I could do it. You could do it. And I want to encourage you to let God speak to you and let the Holy Spirit use you. I, I feel bad. I feel bad that, that those who sit behind us and do all of this wonderful work for us, I feel bad that they feel like they sometimes carry a load because there's nobody else that they can rely on to take up the reins when they are not here. And I want to encourage you Say, you know what, I could, I could do that. I could push a button and put different slides on. I could adjust a, a, a slide on the sound machine and, and adjust this and that. You know, I could sit back and maybe learn how to do the live streaming and get it out to people. Uh, I would encourage you, young or old, we could use you and they could use you. And I want to encourage you to, uh, to pray about that and see where God would use you. And uh, again, let me know, let them know, and uh, we're just going to we're just going to let God do what only God can do. Amen. Hallelujah! God is so good, isn't He? How many know that Journey Church is here not because we decided it was a good idea? How many know that Journey Church is here in Dubuque, Iowa, because God thought it was a good idea? I can't tell you the many number of times in the last twenty-seven years and the stories I heard raining all the way back to 1983 when this church was built. I can't tell you the number of times it has been spoken to me that the devil didn't want us here. The devil didn't want the church here. Matter of fact, the Assemblies of God almost sold the church because I don't think for a while they thought God wanted the church here. But through it all, we are here. Through it all, God had a plan. You see, we're not here by mistake. We are strategically placed here by the Holy Spirit because God wants us and needs us in this community. Amen? We have been strategically positioned by the wisdom of God. And we are where we are because of the wisdom of God. And I love the church. I love the church because it's a place we can come and gather and worship and encourage one another and lift up one another and pray for one another. We need all of those things. And it is a place where you can come and find refreshing. You should be refreshed. We went to the Jesus Revolution movie last night. And I was thinking about the church. And I thought, you know, I love my church. They talked about churches being closed doors. Our doors have never been closed. We don't take anybody and everybody. Matter of fact, we have prayed for that. We prayed the Tommy Barnett prayer that simply says this, God, if nobody else wants them, we'll take them. Tommy Barnett prayed that prayer for years, and he had buses that he would go out and fill up with people. I remember when he was in Davenport, he would send buses past our house in Muscatine, picking up people to take them to church. And in Arizona, California, yeah, he's in Arizona now, one of the largest churches in the country. Why? Because they'll take anybody and everybody. Because everybody is somebody to God. And he has buses where they pick up handicapped people. The first two rows, there's no chairs. 
Because all the handicapped people take up the first few rows of the church. He said, God, if nobody else wants them, I'll take them. And that's in our heartbeat. That's been our prayer for a number of years. God, we'll take anybody and everybody. Sometimes we say, God, why did I say that? But the fact of the matter is we believe. And if we have an open door that God wants to bring people in. And I tell you, you are an amazing church. You are a great church. I sense the love that you have for each other, the concern that you have for each other, right? It, it's here and it's in this place. And I'm grateful for the church that we have. But you know what? This was God's plan. This was God's idea. But God didn't place a church at 3939 Pennsylvania Avenue just so we could come and feel good about each other. God didn't bring a church just so we could come and have a refreshing. Now, we need all of that. But God strategically placed us here, not just for the purpose of gathering together on Sunday morning, but he has commissioned us to go and be released into ministry. And one of the callings, I believe, as a pastor is to equip you. To equip you to go do something for the kingdom of God. Not just to listen to me preach every Sunday morning. Not just to listen to some podcast or listen to some message that's being sent out. It's the idea is to train you and equip you and to encourage you because God has a ministry for you. You see, you live in neighborhoods I don't live in. You go to schools that I don't go to. You go to work for places I don't work. You shop at places I don't shop. You know people I don't know. You have a ministry. And part of what this church is called to do is to commission you and to release you into the ministry that God has called you to. See, the church wasn't founded just to be a place for people to gather, but for a place where people can be equipped and sent. Church isn't a building. The church isn't these walls. It isn't these doors. It isn't these windows. The church is people. The church is a group of people who are on a mission from God. That sounds like an old movie. We're a group of people who are on a mission from God, right? Seeking and saving those who are lost. I tell you, I love our missionaries. I love hearing from our missionaries when they come. I love hearing what's happening in China. I love hearing what's happening in India. I love hearing what's happening in Africa. I love hearing those things because it isn't happening in America, but it's happening all over the world. But in America, churches are either stagnant or they're declining. So I love to hear what God's doing in those other countries because over there, they, they can almost, they can't grow fast enough. The churches aren't big enough. Their homes, church homes, can't hold everybody that wants to be there. But yet we live in a country where we're stagnant and declining, maybe because we've been so comfortable. I think we've gotten too comfortable. In fact, sometimes I think we're so comfortable that we sometimes ignore God completely. We no longer hear him when he speaks to us. Can I tell you that God is speaking to you? He's speaking to you right now. He's going to still be speaking to you in five minutes. He's going to speak to you 10 minutes from now. He's going to speak to you when you leave this church. He's going to speak to you when you get up tomorrow morning. He's going to speak to you at lunchtime tomorrow. He's going to speak to you when you have supper tonight. God loves to speak, and God, doesn't, God is not quiet. There are times when God is quiet, and we should be worried when God's not speaking to us. But we should be listening to the voice of God and hearing the voice of God. I have a friend who used to live down by the railroad tracks off of Romberg. And we would go down to visit him and the train would come by. I mean, he literally lived right across the street from the train tracks down by the Dairy Queen. And the train would come by and we would like have to do sign language to talk to each other. Because it was so loud. And after the train, we'd say, how do you stand it? He goes, I don't even hardly hear it anymore. I've gotten so used to it. And I thought, is that the problem with the church? We've gotten so used to our activities, so used to coming, so used to, right, doing the things we think we're supposed to do, 
have we got so comfortable that we have quit hearing from God? We don't listen anymore. We hear the word and it doesn't change us. We hear the word and we don't apply it. Most of the time what we do is we give ourselves accolades. Says, oh, I know that. I know that. Oh, yeah, pastor, I like that verse. That's a good verse. But the trouble is it never transforms us and changes us into the people of God that we're supposed to be. It just become words. It just becomes story. Turn with me, if you would, to the 29th chapter of the book of Acts. 29th chapter of the book of Acts. I have a problem with the book of Acts. I have a problem because Paul decided to stay in Rome for the last two years, preaching about Jesus, and then the book of Acts ends. Now, if you haven't found Acts 29, it's because it's not there. It ends at Acts 28. It was a trick. But I wanted you to go there. Because I don't like the way this, the book ends. Now, far be it for me to criticize the Holy Spirit. I don't like the way the book ends. Because Paul is basically just preaching to Rome for the last couple years, and then the book is over. And again, I don't want to argue with the Holy Spirit. But it is a terrible ending to a wonderful book. Now, you may think there is not an Acts 29, but I have news for you, there is. There is an Acts 29. It just wasn't written by Luke. It's being wrote by you and me. You see, it's being wrote by us. You see, we're the continuation of the church. We are the history of the church. We are the future of the church. We are the present of the church. We are Acts 29. What bothers me is that Luke doesn't finish the story because the story isn't finished. The story isn't over with until Jesus comes back. The story is still being lived out. The book of Acts is still alive. The book of Acts is still progressing because we finish the story. I remember Peter and Paul and they're not the main character in the book of Acts. Matter of fact, I don't like it when they say that the Acts, it's the Acts of the disciples. I don't agree with that either. The reason I don't agree with it, because if you think that the book of Acts is about the disciples, then what you think is when the disciples are done, then the book is done. And you think when the disciples are over with, the church is over with. It isn't a book about Peter and Paul. and It isn't a book about the Acts of the disciples. It's a book about the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And can I tell you something? The Holy Spirit is still alive. The Holy Spirit is still active. The Holy Spirit is still moving. The same Spirit is the same Spirit today, amen? But the church doesn't look like it did in Acts. See, the book of Acts, Luke continues to tell the story of what Jesus did and what Jesus taught through the church. And I believe Luke is sending us a message today. 2,000 years later, I believe Luke is still speaking to us and saying, is the church moving forward? Is the church progressing? Is the church going to finish the story? Jesus declared in Matthew 18, 16, I will build my church. The church isn't mine. The church isn't yours. The church is his. He says, I will build my church church. Now it's okay to take ownership of your church. People say, what church you go to? I go to Journey. Journey Church is my church. And it is, and that's okay. But the church in a whole, it is God's church. It's not my church. I don't get to regulate it. I don't get to decide what it's going to do. That's God's church. We have to listen to him. Every board meeting we pray, God give us wisdom and direction as leaders of what you want us to do as a church. Because it isn't ours. It's yours. Lord, help us, direct us. God had a plan. Jesus had a plan. He wanted to create a force that could ignite and take the planet by storm, by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. 
I love what he said in Luke 9, 1 and 12. The author of Acts says this. Then he called his 12 disciples together, gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Then he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Can I ask you today, is that the church of today? Is that Journey Church? Are we an active Acts 29 church? Do we understand that we have been given power and authority over any demonic strongholds? Do you understand that you have been given the power to cure diseases, to preach the kingdom of God? That is an Acts 29 church. Jesus was saying, in essence, to his disciples, I'm going to give you everything you need to do to do greater things than I've done. Wow. You see, we are responsible for the Acts 29 church. We're responsible for what hasn't been written yet. We are responsible for what the church looks like and what the church does. And I'm tired of the church being ridiculed. I'm tired of the church being belittled. And I'm tired of the church having its power taken away by the enemy. Because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives in us today. Amen? Most of our churches are not Acts 29 churches. I know a church in California that sits on $2 million worth of property, but they don't hold church services because they only have two people. That's not an Acts 29 church. The other church I heard where the laymen were pushing for an outreach program, and they came to the pastor and said, Pastor, we want to do an outreach program. The pastor said, no, I don't think it's necessary. Can I tell you something? That's not an Acts 29 church. I've heard through the ages and just recently churches who don't believe in missions. There are churches in the assemblies of God who don't support missions. And we are a missions activated and acclimated and supporting foundation. But yeah, there are churches who say, well, I don't, I don't agree with missions. You don't agree with missions. It's like, man, you better get in line with God. Go forth into all the world. I know one church here in Iowa where the pastor didn't want to be part of the Assemblies of God anymore. So he went out and brought in a bunch of new, he went out and got himself a whole bunch of new members. He didn't go through the membership process, he just made them members on his own. And then he got them to go against the constitution and bylaw of the church. He got them to overrule it because he had more members than what the church had and ended up leaving the Assemblies of God. That is not an Acts 29 church. Turn with me to the first chapter of the book of Acts. So I think it's really important for us to go back to the beginning. So let's go to the beginning. Let's go to where this whole thing started, shall we? Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at just the first 11 verses this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Your word is active and living and breathing. Your word is useful for correction, rebuking, and training in righteousness. Your word is alive today. And I pray, Lord, it becomes alive in our hearts and our spirits, our minds. I thank you, Lord, for this word. Let us not just be hearers of it, but doers of it. We thank you now for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, this is Luke writing, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And if you read the book of Acts, or the book of Luke, that is exactly what the book of Luke is all about. Teaching all that Jesus did and all that he taught. Until that day where he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. He spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, Jesus gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, 
you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said for, to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has sent by his own authority, has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So I think the beginning is where we need to start when we talk about the church, because this is the birth of the church. Happy birthday. In a few weeks, we'll be celebrating Pentecost Sunday. Basically what that is, it's the church's birthday. It's the day that the church started. It's the day that the church began. It's the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out and Peter preached and 5,000 people got saved. The beginning of the church. I think we should have a church celebration. I think we should have a church birthday party. This was the beginning of the church, the beginning of it. And you and I are a continuation of Jesus' ministry. You and I are a continuation of Jesus' ministry. Luke wrote, I wrote all that Jesus began to do and teach. He said, I didn't write everything that Jesus began to do and teach. He said, I just wrote everything that Jesus began to do and teach. You and I are called the body of Christ. What does that mean? That means we're doing what Christ has called us to do. We are who he wants us to be. There was once a, a village who had a statue of Jesus whose arms were, were out, and a storm came one day and, and destroyed the statue. And the people of the village were over, overwhelmed, and they said, we, we need to put it back together. So they put it back together as, as well as they could, but the hands were so broken, they couldn't figure out what to do. They said, well, we can put the statue together, but there won't be any hands. And finally, somebody said, that's okay. We'll put up a sign at the bottom and says, you are now my hands. You are now the hands of Jesus. You are now the disciples of Christ. You are now the apostles. You are now the prophets. You are now the evangelists. You are now the pastors. You are now the missionaries. You are now the teachers. You are. You are the body of Christ extended. You are the completion of Jesus' ministry. If you look what Paul says, all I, and Luke says, all I did was look at what Jesus did, and then that's what the church did. That's simple. All we have to do, if you want to be in Acts 29 church, listen and look at what Jesus did and then do the same. We saw Jesus preaching. The church needs to preach. They saw him praying. We need to pray. The early church prayed for signs and wonders, and you know what they got? Signs and wonders. Jesus said, you have not because you asked not. They asked for signs and wonders, and what did they get? Signs and wonders. When was the last time you asked God for a sign and a wonder? We see them filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? They saw him healing, and they healed. We should be praying for people to be healed. He raised the dead, and so did they. We need to be believing in God raising the dead. Willie's son experienced that in his church. A gentleman died right in the middle. How I many you know that's a real bummer when somebody dies in the middle of a church service? But you know what? They laid hands over and prayed with him. You know what God did? God brought him back to life. Wow. The faith to believe, amen? They saw Jesus showing compassion, and they did the very same thing. 
And I'm asking 2,000 years later, can it be said that we are doing the same thing? There was a community who invited Billy Graham to come in and speak. And somebody in the group was very upset and said, I don't want Billy Graham coming because if he comes in here, he's old school. And he'll set the church 50 years back in evangelism if we invite Billy Graham to come and speak. Well, Billy Graham heard about the statement that was being made. And he says, I want to apologize to the church. He goes, my plan is not to set the church back 50 years. My plan is to set the church back 2,000 years. To take it back to the very essence of its beginning when it was filled with power and authority. And people were being saved every single day. See, the church of Jesus Christ needs to get back to just being the church of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that church? Scripture says they turned the world upside down. I want to be an upside down turner. See, I'm tired of the world turning us upside down. I'm tired of them pushing agendas on us, wanting our children to believe that these things are acceptable and okay when Scripture says it's an abomination unto the Lord. See, I think it's time the church began to turn the world upside down instead of the world turning the church upside down. And we have the power to do that, amen? You see, that's how a normal church is supposed to operate. Can I say that again? That's how a normal church is supposed to operate. That's how normal churches are supposed to operate. I love what Vance Hafner said one day. He said this. He said, the churches today are so subnormal that if any of them gets normal, everybody thinks they're abnormal. He says, but I'm willing to take the risk. See, if we were the church in the New Testament, if we were the church of the book of Acts, and people were being coming in and being prayed over and healed for, people were being slain under the power of the Holy Spirit, people were being saved every time we had a church service, people were praying and hungry for the things of God, people were compassionate for the lost, seeking and saving and bringing their family and their friends, if we were that church, people would say, there's something wrong. That's not normal. That is normal. But you see, we've gotten so subnormal that if we got normal, we would think we we're abnormal. God forgive us. Secondly, we have a message that is certain. I love this. After his suffering, it says in verse 3, he presented himself, Jesus presented himself to them. He gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and you know what he did? He spoke about the kingdom of God. He spoke about the kingdom of God. We have a message that is certain. Listen, our, the truth of our message doesn't rest on our experience. It just rests on the fact that it's true. It's just truth. Jesus is alive, and he proved it without a shadow of a doubt. If there was any way his enemies could have proven that he was still dead, they would have done it. But they couldn't do it because he was alive. The tomb was empty, amen? He walked out of the tomb. And what was his focus? He says, guys, I only got 40 days with him. But what, if you only had 40 days to send with somebody, you'd probably want to list the most important things you could share and tell them. Isn't that true? She said, let me tell you the most important thing I can share with you. It's about the kingdom of God. That's what we should be talking about. That's what we should be sharing with. You see, we have a spirit. Third thing is we have a spirit that's empowering us. It says in verse 5, in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I've heard people make this distinction that the spirit of God that rested on Jesus and the spirit of God that that we have is less than. That you and I have received a watered-down version of the Holy Spirit. That Jesus had a bigger spirit than we did. That Jesus received more power than we did. That's not what Scripture tells me. It says in Romans 8, 11, for the same spirit, not a different spirit, but the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. We don't have a watered-down version of the Holy Spirit. We have the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Wow, if we could just learn to tap into that and understand that. Acts 15, 28 says, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. See, the church was so sensitive to the Holy Spirit 
They allowed the Holy Spirit to direct them and guide them into every decision. Are you doing that in your life? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you and direct you in every decision that you make? See, the Holy Spirit has been given to us to lead us. Holy Spirit's been given to us to guide us. Romans 8, 14 says, As many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And fourthly, early church, we have a mandate to spread the gospel until Jesus returns. I have great news. Last Sunday, I had two sisters and a brother who gave themselves to the Lord. Why? Because I gave him a simple invitation. said, I believe God saved me from sheer death, gave me a second chance at life, because my family still needs Jesus. And so I said, God, I'm not wasting any time. I'm going after him. And so I invited them to listen to last Sunday's message. I pray they're listening to today's message. My younger brother sent me an amazing text message. He said, thank you. He said, I didn't know I needed what you shared with me this morning. He goes, I didn't think I deserved what you shared with me this morning. And he says, I made my choice. He says, I made my choice. You know, God is good, isn't he? My older sister sat in the very back row and it was time to pray the prayer of salvation. She raised her hand. The sister in Arizona who contacted my sister Pam and said, tell Terry to send me one of those brochures wanting to know about this new decision that they had made. Why? Because we have a mandate to spread the gospel until he comes. They gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you going to, to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the dates or the times my father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in your hometown, in Samaria, the people that you don't like. See, the Samaritans weren't friends of the Jews. And I found it a little almost amusing that Jesus would mention their names. In fact, when Jesus wanted to go to Samaria, we know about the woman at the well. They didn't want to go through the Samaria with him. He says, no, we need to go because there are people who need Jesus. There are some people we don't like very well. Jonah didn't like the Ninevites. He wanted to go the other way. But Jesus says, no, you are to be my witnesses, even to the people that you don't like, even the people that you don't agree with. Even the people that stand in opposition, opposition of your faith, you need to preach to them the good news. We have a mandate to spread the gospel until Jesus comes. Don't let the enemy distract you. Lastly, we have a king that's returning. Man, I love this. This is the best part of the message to me. We have a king who's coming back. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going. I could just see this happening in my mind. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven, he will come back. Well before Arnold Schwarzenegger said, I'll be back. Right? These two men, speaking to these men in Galilee, said, why are you looking to this? He's coming back. He's coming back. In the same way you saw him go, he's coming back again. Several years I worked as an assistant manager and then a manager and then a, a district manager trainee for, for Walgreens. But I'll never forget one of the first weeks that I was working in Walgreens. And all of a sudden... One of the ladies had gotten a phone call and sent a message to the manager who quickly yelled at me to do two or three different things. Do, I need you to do this right. Everybody in the store started running around like crazy, like chickens with their head cut off. And I thought, what is going on? And all they were saying, he's coming. He's coming. Who's coming? And then I saw this guy walk in with this briefcase, and I could see that he was intently looking at everything. And then pretty soon he would meet with the manager. They have long conversations. 
And then as soon as this guy walked out the door, you could feel the whole scenario, the whole uh, atmosphere of the store. <sighs> he's gone. And it's like, who is this guy? Well, I found out he's the district manager. And boy, when he came in, you wanted to have everything spick, spot, and in shape and in alignment, right? This is what they wanted. And one of the ladies told me after they were saying, well, we have a system. The store has a system. And I thought, well, the district manager isn't stupid. He knows it. Well, he says, what happens when he shows up here, we call all the other stores around us to let us know he's on the way or that he could be coming. And I thought, wow, this is just one guy who's coming. How can he cause such chaos and confusion and have everybody running around like crazy. Can I tell you that one day Jesus is coming back and we're not going to have time to prepare for him to come. There is not going to be a warning system. You're not going to get a phone call to say, hey, guess what? He's on his way. You better shape up and, and get things put in order because if you don't, he's going to come down on you pretty hard. Listen, that we won't have a warning system when he shows up. He's just going to come back and he says, you need to be ready. We get so worried about the time or the date or when's it going to be. Is it going to be now? Is it going to be at this time? Is it going to be this year? 88 reasons why Jesus was coming back in 88 and they were all wrong. Because <laughs> it's 2023 and he still hasn't come back. All the things we look at and think, I'm going to spend all my time trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back. Forget it. No man knows and no man will know. Only the Father in heaven knows and he will let the Son know when it's time to come. And the only thing, when they, when they badgered Jesus and kept asking him over and over, what's going to happen? When's it going to happen? What's it going to look like? And over and over, Jesus' response was simply, watch, pray, and be ready. He's coming back, church. And we're not going to get a warning signal. We're not going to get a phone call beforehand. You won't be getting a text message from the pastor saying, oh, I just heard from Jesus, you got three minutes <laughs> to get your life in order. We're not going to have any of that. First Thessalonians tells us in the twinkling of an eye, the mighty sound of the trumpets, and it's over. He's coming back. The dead in Christ will rise first, and those of us who are still alive, I hope I still am, are going to get to fly in the air to be with him. My favorite hymns, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh Lord. Yeah, take me, Jesus. Some sad day when, I, I'm forgetting the words, but yeah, I'll fly away. Hallelujah. Let me tell you again what Jesus said. Watch. The signs are all around us. You would have to be blind to see what's happening in our world today to realize that the enemy is setting things up. He is setting up the system of government. He's setting up our system of finance. He's setting up churches for the great apostasy. But we're already walking away from the truth of God's word coming up with their own things that they want to give itching ears to make them feel good. We can see the writing on the wall. Jesus says, just watch. Just watch. Just by watching, you will know it's coming soon. He says, but be in prayer. Be people of prayer. Pray. He says, and then be ready. Well, how do we get ready? We turn our lives over to him. And that we live each day under his authority. We live each day under his commissioning and under his calling. We live each day under his anointing. We live each day under his power and authority. We live each day influenced by the power of his Holy Spirit. We live each day giving him glory and praise and honor. That should be how our days lived out because... It's 11.18, but by 11.20, we could all be home with Jesus. No man knows the date or the hour. Vince Lombardi was not and is not one of my favorite people because I'm not a Packer fan. But Vince Lombardi was a winning coach. 
Vince Lombardi had taken the Packers from 1959 to 1967, and he was famous for emphasizing the basics of football, the fundamentals of football. He's also famous for some sayings like, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing, or do it right and you'll win. One day, Packers got beat by a team that shouldn't have beat them. And Vince Lombardi was upset, so upset that he didn't speak to his team. He didn't speak to his team on the way home. He didn't speak to his team on the bus. He didn't speak to his team on the plane. He waited till the next day when the entire team was called into his office. And he pulled out a duffel bag and he reached in and he said, Pay attention. This is a football. <laughs> he was emphasizing if we don't do the basics, we're never going to win. This is a football. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we don't deal with the basics, it doesn't matter how successful we think we are. It doesn't matter how many wins we think we're going to have. We got to do the basics. And the early church understood that. And they lived by the basics of the gospel. Amen. You and I need to do the same. One of the things that Justy and I have been praying for and wanting is to grow journey groups. Small groups that would gather in homes. Because you see, I don't believe church is just Sunday morning. I believe church should be all week long. I would love for journey groups to once again be resurrected, gathering together in homes, sharing the gospel, encouraging each other, praying for each other. I encourage prayer groups. We love groups getting together just simply to pray. Not to gossip, but to pray. Churches getting together to groups getting together to say, you know, we have, we have something in common and we want to do the best we can. We want to live the best we can. So I believe that's what the early church did. The early church met in homes. They broke bread together. They prayed together. I want to encourage you to be prepared. Maybe to lead a group, start a group, lead a prayer group, start a prayer group, attend a group. Well, I mean, it's all part of how we grow the church. So there will be somebody you know who won't come to church with you on Sunday morning, but they'll come to your house on Tuesday night. And you can introduce them to who Jesus is. Amen. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you for being an awesome, amazing, powerful, loving God. Thank you for the early church. And thank you that Acts 29 isn't over. It's still being wrote. The Lord Journey Church in Dubuque, Iowa is not here by accident. You strategically planted us here for a purpose and a calling because you want us to be part of Acts 29. Lord, I can't always say that we've been the church we should be, but I can say I've always wanted to be the church we can be. Lord, I pray that you'd help us individually understand the mandate of our calling, the purpose of why we're here, and to walk with you, for you, and in you. I pray for those, Lord, who don't feel like they're part of the church, that today you would open up their hearts and realize that the church is just an extension of you. We're not perfect. We fail but we love and we accept and we offer forgiveness and grace. I pray, Lord, for those who aren't ready for your return, those who are hoping that they're going to get a phone call, a warning signal, and yet scriptures tell us that that's not going to happen. I pray for those who aren't ready for your return, that this morning they would make a decision to become a child of God. They would ask you to forgive them of their sins. They would ask you to come and live into their hearts and into their lives. They would commit to follow you and serving you and studying your word and looking to be more like you. 
We pray for them this morning, Lord, as they make that decision that your Holy Spirit would guide them. Jesus, in your name, I ask for the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you for loving me. Come into my life and help me to live for you. Thank you for the hope that is now mine and the new life that you've given to me. Thank you that I am secure, not in what I've done, but what what you did on the cross for me. And thank you that when you return, I know that I know that I know I will spend eternity with you in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love and grace over my life. We prayed that prayer this morning. Welcome to the church. And now you are the church. Go and do good things, great things. Allow the Holy Spirit that now lives in you to do greater things through you than you could ever hope or imagine. I pray that the Spirit of God that lives within all of us in this church would well up and anoint us and equip us and empower us to do more than we've done up to this day. And I'm excited about the future of the church because I know that you trust Jesus and I know what Jesus can do when we put ourselves into his care. So church, would you stand with me this morning? I want to pray a blessing over you. Our God is awesome, isn't he? You are the church. You have been called for a divine purpose, a divine destination, and a divine calling. But God did not leave you to your own devices. He has given you the power of the Holy Spirit to anoint you, to equip you, and to send you. He did not give you a spirit of fear or a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and authority. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. I encourage you to live under that wisdom and under that knowledge. Enemy, I know that what we spoke of today, you hate. But it brings joy to us to know that we are living for the kingdom of God. Enemy, we're going to put you on alert. Journey Church is not a place for you to mess with. We understand our authority in the name of Jesus. And we have been given power over every demon and over every authority of darkness. And we cast you in Jesus' name. You will find no place here to do your work. For we have been sealed under the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you are silenced so that we don't even be led away from your lies of deception. We know the truth. We will stand on the truth. We will preach the truth. We will speak the truth and we will live the truth. Father, would you bless your church? Would you let your face shine upon us? Would you cloak us with the countenance of the presence of your spirit? And would you give us peace that passes understanding? I thank you for every good and perfect gift that you have given to us. It's a symbol of your glory that's been bestowed upon us. Let us take that glory And let us illuminate to the darkness of this world the power of our God. As we receive these things, we are grateful, Lord, not for the moment, not for the season, but we're going to be grateful for all eternity. And we're going to sing your praises with the elders around the throne room of grace. To you be the glory, today and forever. And all who receive from the Spirit said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll look forward to seeing you next week or tomorrow night because I dared you and I'm going to double dog dare you to come to celebrate recovery tomorrow night at 6. Amen.